So I'm now going to <laughs> ask Professor McElroy to take us through um, to the policy implications of what we heard before the break. John. Thanks. Um, I've drawn the short straw uh, here. Uh, academics always like talking about their research, and uh, my colleagues have done that. Uh, so I'm left with talking about policy. But I'll be saying a little bit more about bits of research that um, Anna, Lorraine, and Claire uh, didn't have time to mention as we, as we go along. OK, uh, let's start with university access. Um, and with entry to any uh, university to begin with. Well, it's clear from um, Lorraine's uh, presentation, I hope, that um, <laughs> if we want to close those uh, socioeconomic gaps in the probability of going to university, uh, any university, then prior attainment, raising prior attainment, is the absolute um, key that when we controlled for prior attainment at age 16, actually there's no difference in the probability of going to university between people from low and high socioeconomic um, groups. Hence, in terms of policy, it's not enough to have policies designed to uh, raise um, young people's uh, aspirations, offer them information, financial assistance, although all of that may have a positive impact on their attainment uh, too, which would be good. But um, what one needs to do is aim directly at, uh, at improving, improving their attainment. Um, but um, policies to, to try and achieve that over the years, which of course there have been many, uh, have for, their own, for its own sake, not just as to get them uh, people from lower socioeconomic groups into university have had very mixed um, success. So, spending on the early years, pupil premium, uh, school reforms of various uh, different types. And I think it's uh, pretty obvious that there's no silver bullet um, in uh, this area. So, uh, for once, the, um, the academics' request for more research seems uh, appropriate, um, and that is a policy conclusion, that we need more uh, evidence in um, a range of different areas about uh, what works. Now, what about high-status um, universities? Well, um, uh, raising prior attainment of people with low socioeconomic... Uh, of, of children from lower socioeconomic um, families, poorer families, that's also really important to closing those socioeconomic gaps in attendance at high status uh, universities, uh, a goal which of course is exactly the aim of, um, of uh, uh, Chris Wilson's brilliant club, so it's really good that he's um, here on the panel. Now, by prior attainment here, our research shows that um, the definition of that should include subject choice at both uh, GCSE uh, and A-levels. So to get into the high-status universities, it's not just uh, enough to have enough GCSE points, enough A-level points. You need points in the, uh, the right subjects. And, of course, that's formalised by the Russell Group's um, a definition of so-called facilitating subjects. It's going to facilitate entry into a, a Russell Group um, university. However, even if we control our, for um, prior attainment, including the subjects that people choose to do, there are still, there's still um, uh, slight differences in, in the probabilities of people from different socioeconomic groups applying to universities, the offers uh, they get, um, uh, the probability of acceptances. Um, some of that's documented uh, in our book. Uh, but I should also here mention um, the work of uh, Vicky Bolivar at uh, York, uh, who has a some different take in places uh, to us, uh, who's focused on, on that sort of issue. Um, so staying with uh, university uh, access, uh, we might think that contextualised admissions, as they're called, uh, would help. Uh, in other words, universities... Uh, taking account of the context of where 
uh, an applicant is coming from when deciding um, to make uh, an offer, i.e. lower offers for people from uh, more disadvantaged uh, backgrounds on the assumption on the assumption that, in fact, um, those uh, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds with slightly lower grades actually have the same potential to do well at um, university. Now, um, there are two points to make about that. Firstly is um, one would need, if one's pushing that as a policy, to ensure that universities didn't have a disincentive to uh, make contextualised offers because, of course, average A-level tariff of their entrance is one of the uh, league table measures, so contextualised offers will drive that down. So you'd want to admit those uh, offers um, from, uh, from the league tables. Uh, the second point, more fundamentally, is um, that assumption that uh, people with slightly lower uh, advantaged, uh, a slightly more disadvantaged background have the potential to do as well at uh, universities, people with a higher background. Well, there you need to go, uh, you need to tread carefully. Our research uh, looking at that issue shows that, as um, uh, Lorraine uh, said before the break in reply to a, a question from uh, Nick Hillman, on average, um, uh, if you take pupils with the same uh, level of attainment, those from lower performing schools uh, do better at university uh, than those from higher uh, performing um, schools. And performance in this sense, I think, is, is just a crude measure of uh, the performance of their students. It's not a value added, uh, it's not a value added um, statement. Now, um, that uh, statement I've made um, holds for. Uh, school characteristics, whereas if you look at um, pupils with the same attainment, uh, those from uh, lower socioeconomic groups, those from poorer uh, families, uh, actually do do somewhat worse at university uh, than those from higher um, uh, socioeconomic um, backgrounds. So that's why the context, we argue uh, in the book that uh, the first thing to look at if you wanted to push contextualised uh, admissions would be to look at school characteristics of uh, applicants and not uh, their family um, uh, background characteristics. And if you did want to contextualise your offers on the basis of family uh, background or neighbourhood uh, characteristics, then you've got to accept that those people may not do as well at universities, so you've got to make sure there's the policy uh, also in place to support them through university to make sure they don't, they're not falling um, behind um, the others. Okay. Um, well, finally on access, one has to say something about um, fees and uh, student maintenance. Okay, it's... Um, it's clear, as uh, Lorraine showed one slide uh, with, uh, I think, a very convincing diagram, that um, the recent changes to the funding uh, system, in particular fees and uh, systems of loans that students have faced, have not been associated with um, widening socioeconomic gaps. I showed you a diagram where the lines are actually slightly time series of participation by socioeconomic group are actually slightly <coughs> converging. That statement, and indeed all the evidence in our book, relates to young full-time students. This is not a book about part-time students. It's not a book about mature students, and there's another set of issues um, there. Okay, but um, that doesn't mean everything's... Uh, all dandy, um, because there have been a number of policy changes uh, recently and coming down the track where we, we really don't know yet what their impact is going to be. The first of those would be the replacement uh, of maintenance grants uh, by um, loans 
So from now on, it really will be the poorest um, students who have the largest uh, debts, whereas uh, before it wasn't. It was the middle-income students who had the, um, uh, the largest um, debts. Uh, secondly, it would be the freezing of um, the uh, thresholds uh, for uh, repayment salary uh, when, when repayment of your loan starts, the fixing of... Um, uh, the salary thresholds that uh, trigger that, the freezing in real terms. And thirdly, the raising of um, tuition fees uh, via uh, teaching excellence framework and other possibilities for raising fees uh, in the future. So there's some, definitely some policy starting, policy coming down the track that may change things that we can't uh, see the evidence of yet. But there's certainly some things that we can say that we could be uh, doing better, so already you can say that. Firstly, um, there's the issue of um, uh, the bursaries and fee waivers that universities offer um, to, univers uh, to students as part of their agreement with the Office uh, for Fair Access. And it's great, we've got um, Les Ebden here on the panel too. Um, those, uh, that support needs to be made clear ex ante, before students apply, so that students know that if they go to University A with the income level that their parents have got, they will get so much. If they go to University B, they will get so much. And um, a big problem to begin with, with these sorts of um, uh, bursary and fee support, was that, those, that support was only becoming clear ex post, after students have taken the decision to apply to particular universities or, uni or even accept their uh, offers. Um, so we need to reduce uncertainty for students in that way. Secondly, the government can reduce uh, uncertainty for students by making clear that the loan terms that students borrow uh, from the student loan company under are fixed rather than uh, or the term, I mean, the, the system's fixed. I mean, it may be a, a variable rate depending on what happens, just as a mortgage might be a variable rate. But at least uh, the, the, the terms are, are fixed. Um, and thirdly, I think there needs to be um, more, uh, another look at maintenance. Um, all the discussion's really been about fees and not about um, <coughs> maintenance um, and the replacement of maintenance <coughs> Uh, grants and maintenance loans really, I think, got uh, relatively little attention. Now, um, we had some discussion before the break about mobility, and they were talking about, in, in reply to a question, Anna uh, was talking about mobility in the labour market, and also a bit about mobility. She began to stray on to mobility of student mobility, where people go to university around the country. Now, um, we're often seen in, in the UK, particularly in England, folks our book, as being a real outlier internationally now in terms of the level of our fees. We're actually a bit of an outlier too in the amount of support uh, we give to students. So Italy, there's a country where I spent a number of years, uh, low fees, very low fees, but very little support in terms of maintenance. So you go to the local university. And we have a culture that uh, traditionally has allowed people to move around the country, and maintenance is a key thing that maintains um, that uh, culture. Now, if you haven't uh, looked at it, I encourage you to um, have a look at the Diamond Review on um, student support in Wales, uh, that was uh, and university finance in Wales. It was published in um, September, so it's very recent. And uh, Ian Diamond and his colleagues come out very firmly in favour of a dramatic shift in Welsh policy to uh, take away government support for fees. Sort of Welsh students have not been paying the increased £9,000 uh, fees, whether they stay in Wales or whether they go elsewhere. If they go elsewhere, then the Welsh Assembly, uh, the Welsh uh, administration will, will pay for them. And Ian Diamond suggests shifting that support actually into maintenance. And so students would, um, well, all students would get some sort of maintenance grant, and there'd be um, quite generous means-tested maintenance grants, and then a ton loan on top of it, uh, aiming at giving students quite a reasonable income level. Um, and that's relevant, I think, to the, the question we had before the break about financial stress 
of the students when they go to university. Because, well, the fees aren't up front. The maintenance costs are up front. You do have to meet them. And the issue is, have you got enough uh, resources to meet them? Now, our, our third panellist, um, Nick Barr, uh, uh, has written a, a very nice paper, Student Grants and Student um, Poverty, with um, his co-author, William Lowe, um, in... Um, 1988, so uh, <laughs> it was very far thinking. And uh, uh, I, uh, I was looking at it again on the, on the way on the, tra uh, on the train up here, and um, it's actually very good, and I'd like to give him a public apology for our, our not actually referring to it in the book. I think we should, because it's a good paper. Second edition. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's move on to um, degree uh, outcomes. Now, um, where there's a, a definitely a need for, uh, for intervention um, here too. Now, um, we've seen that socioeconomic gaps in, in degree completion, whether people drop out, whether they complete, and in the, the class of degree they get, those gaps remain amongst students who are similar on en at, en at entry in terms of their um, uh, prior uh, attainment and Claire showed that um, I think very very effectively. So raising the prior achievement of the um, uh, students from lower socioeconomic groups is uh, important in closing that gap too. And how well people do at university, conditional on their going to university. Um, however, there's again I think it's a lack of uh, of uh, high quality evidence on uh, what works to promote um, uh, retention uh, and um, progression through university um, and more evidence in that area is clearly needed. Anything that increases a student's sense of belonging and attachment to university is clearly going to be good and uh, it may not only be good uh, for the student in the university at the time. It may be good afterwards in terms of um, alumni donations. Um, now, uh, later success uh, after completing undergraduate studies, where the challenges for policy continue uh, again. Um, now, students who uh, are similar in terms of um, uh, academic performance, prior attainment when entering university, Claire has shown us, um, have different outcomes um, after university depending on their socioeconomic um, background. Now, some students completing their undergraduate studies will uh, want to go on to postgraduate um, study. And so the uh, new <coughs> postgraduate loan scheme is, uh, in principle, uh, a welcome uh, feature. But um, it really needs to be <coughs> adequately uh, evaluated. Um, it's a big unknown as to whether um, students really will want to take on uh, more uh, <coughs> debt. OK, it's not credit card debt. It's income contingent loan debt, which... Uh, Nick, amongst other people, has been very firm on pointing out uh, the difference uh, in. But uh, postgraduate loan might mean, I think, a, an additional 6% marginal uh, repayment rate on top of your 9% marginal repayment rate from undergraduate uh, loan. Um, other students, of course, will be entering um, the labour market. And uh, we, th we uh, suggest a couple of areas that could be looked at more. One is university career services, doing more to help uh, the lower socioeconomic group um, students. And then on the other side, employers. Um, there are clearly some efforts being made by employers to, uh, to so-called blind their admissions um, of, um, of new staff and to make sure they don't know anything about uh, socioeconomic background. And uh, there's more that could be done there. And then, of course, a whole relevant debate about access to the professions, uh, for example, that we could uh, bring in. Okay, to, um, to, to finish, um, 
Socioeconomic gaps in university uh, access and outcomes are a long, long standing uh, problem for policy, and narrowing those gaps remains a big um, policy uh, challenge. Um, and some of our discussion in chapter one uh, goes back over, over the past in, 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 this, um, in this context. Now, the government is clearly committed to reducing those gaps and has set um, uh, a target, ambitious target, to, for example, double the percentage of students from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, who are progressing to higher education by the year um, 2020. But, as we've tried to emphasise um, firmly, uh, simply getting people through the door to university is, um, is not enough. It's important to show ensure that students can get to study the subjects they want to study and the institutions that they'd like to go to that generate <coughs> uh, high returns, subjects, combination in, uh, subjects and institutions, if that's what the students are, are looking for. So it's, it's, it's not just access to any university, it's access to high status universities, access to high paying um, subjects. And performing well once uh, you get there. So getting through the door alone is not uh, enough. And of course, outcomes beyond graduation are also important. And finally, it's worth remembering that um, when we talk about gaps and we think about, oh, we've got to pull these people at the bottom up to close that gap, the people at the top, they may be moving away too. So you've got to keep your eye on the gap and what's happening at the top. If closing the gap is your aim rather than just increasing the level of these people uh, at the bottom. Thank you. Now, and a wealth of uh, policy implications, proposals to add to the wealth of data we had in the first half. So I'm going to turn straight to our panel to um, <coughs> take us where we will. Um, Nick Barr, as you've been listening to this, what sort of questions? Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. I mean, just coming back to John's point about the gaps, I mean, one of the results that I was gobsmacked to see was, if I remember rightly, 70% of students from the best, the, the top socioeconomic groups get two ones or firsts. I mean, that's, that's a very tough act to try to catch up with. Um, I am told that as you get older, you're supposed to get grumpy. So let me start off with two grunts. One is, um, <coughs> some of you probably heard me talk about pub economics. Pub economics is something that's obviously right and everyone knows it's right, but it's wrong. And one of the, sorry, if I don't do that, it's gonna keep on. <coughs> One, one, an example of pub economics is that the main thing that stops people from poor backgrounds going to university is tuition fees, and what you need to widen participation is to have free higher education. <coughs> um, my second grump is that the world is full of nifty wheezes, often by government ministers, often unsupported by evidence. And to me, the hugely important contribution of this book is, first of all, it punctures <coughs> public, the pub economics, and secondly, it provides quantitative evidence. Um, I've got just one slide. This is a very old bit of data, but it's still, in a way, is the single most powerful storyteller. The pair of histograms on the left show participation in higher education by young people with the very best A-level grades, and you can see it's sort of between 95 and 97 percent. And as I say, these data go back to about 2004. The next pair are young people with good, but not quite such good A-levels. And what this says is the better your A-levels, the more likely you are to participate in higher education, which is obvious and deeply boring. But if you come back to the, the first pair, dark blue, top three socioeconomic groups, light blue, bottom three socioeconomic groups. So what this says is, if you get them to good A-levels, they will go to university. If you control for prior attainment, the socioeconomic gradient largely disappears. Now, there's a lot behind that that this doesn't, doesn't cover which institutions people go to, etc. But it does tell a very powerful story 
that if you're serious about analysing participation, it's no good just obsessing from 18 onwards. You've got to go way back earlier in the system. And that's exactly what this book does, and that's its great strength. So if we ask the question, what stops people going to university? Um, two things. Credit constraints and prior constraints. Credit constraints meaning in a world with no grants and no loans, the only people who could go to university are people whose families could help them. A good loan system, properly designed, income contingent repayments, etc., is designed to fix that. Um, constraints with earlier routes, lack of attainment in school, deficient information including uncertainty. We've heard from one of the speakers the importance of stress, the differential ability of students to cope with stress. Financial stress is much less acute if you know that the bank of mum and dad can help if necessary than if you know there really is no family support. Um, and the analytical error in a lot of the literature which this book nails is that the argument that higher education should be free uh, attributes to the credit constraint the outcomes that are determined mainly by the prior attainment constraint. It's overstating it to say it's got nothing to do with what happens once people are 18, so long as there's a good loan system. But it's certainly the case that if you ignore what goes on before, you're ignoring a huge part of the story. Um, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if you spend access money in the wrong way, it's not going to help the people that you want to help. And my prime example of this, and I'm now going to get very grumpy, is the absurd design of the British loan system at the moment, whereby <coughs> huge amounts of taxpayer money go down the gurgler and never come back. And what's wrong with that? Well, I'm not saying this as a loan tragic concerned about the purity of loans, but if loans cost the taxpayer too much, the Treasury is going to do stuff. What's going to happen? Well, they're going to restrict the number of loans, which harms access, because if there's fewer loans, there's fewer places, um, and that harms access. They're going to restrict the size of loans, again affecting access, particularly for students who can't rely on family support. Um, Treasury might restrict student numbers, as it did until quite recently, to uh, contain the cost of student support. Um, and more generally, money you spend on loans, on leaky loans, is money you can't spend on policies that do, that have very powerful effects on widening participation earlier in the system. So the right policies, and this I think emphasises what John's been talking about, the policies that address credit constraints include things like financial support to, com to, to, to stay on and complete A-levels or equivalent. It includes a good loan system. It includes policies that respond to genuine debt aversion, so there is a role for grants, but I think there is an ongoing research agenda about how you target grants so that the money is spent on those for whom access is general, uh, ge genuinely the most fragile. And uh, the fourth and final policy to address credit constraints is uh, flexible options for part-time study. So there is a lot you can do to help people from 18 plus, but you need the policies to address prior constraints, so increased emphasis on early child development, which wasn't the main focus of this study, action to improve school outcomes, which is very much uh, what the book is about, and um, things like improving information and raising aspirations. So to sum up what's good about the book, one, it knocks pub economics on the head, two, it does so using quantitative analysis, it's not just an ideology fueled intuition, um, it's done by the right people who understand how you use numbers well, and finally and very importantly, it's written to be understandable to policy makers and journalists, not only to <coughs> quantitative nerds. So I think this is enormously useful, it's terrific to have it out, I know it's been a long time in the writing, but it's been worth waiting for. So, congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's true, of course, policy landscapes have changed entirely during the writing of the book. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to turn to Les Epton. Les. Thank you. Well, do I need to stand up? Uh, yeah, I will. Yeah. You're a long way back there. Um, 
Uh, can I add my welcome to the uh, book as well, um, uh, to uh, follow on from, from Nick there? I think uh, <coughs> it's a very uh, timely uh, uh, book. Um, it, it's full of uh, evidence, evidence that I will certainly be using, um, and uh, I hope uh, other uh, policymakers will be uh, turning to. Uh, we've heard um, a lot about what the current challenges are. Uh, let's uh, just remind ourselves um, uh, the success that we've had uh, in, in widening access um, in, in recent years. A 65% increase, and the book actually uh, details uh, this um, in the uh, 10 years, first 10 years that we've had access agreements, uh, for example, um, the uh, lowest 20% quintile one in the polar definition uh, have increased in their participation from 11.2% to 18.5% uh, overall, and that increase has continued uh, uh, this year. Uh, we, uh, 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 but of course, it still means that you're 2.4 times more likely to be in university if you come from the most advantaged uh, uh, quintile uh, than from the most disadvantaged. And we've also seen an increase in the uh, so-called high-status um, uh, uh, universities. We struggle to find a name that isn't offensive uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this group of universities. Uh, they've uh, increased from 2.3% to 3.3% uh, uh, since 2006. <coughs> And that includes a, a 48, uh, uh, that's a 48% increase, and includes a 27% increase uh, since 2012, which happens to be when I became uh, Director of Fair Access. <laughs> <coughs> so we've seen um, uh, uh, an improvement, uh, but we can see how far we have to go with that particular uh, group of, of, of universities. What I do like, though, about um, the book is that it places the emphasis very much on what we call the whole student life cycle. It's as much about student success, it's as much about getting on as it is about um, uh, getting in. Uh, and uh, uh, therefore it draws attention to the attainment gap, the differences that you will achieve if you come from a lower socioeconomic background compared to the more advantaged uh, parts. Not just in terms of what you'll get as a degree, not just in terms of whether you'll be successful or not, whether you'll drop out or not, but also in terms of employment. Uh, and these are very real issues that we've got to tackle. I might add, too, that, um, that we need to tackle the uh, postgraduate uh, challenge. Uh, very often, entry to the professions these days is via a postgraduate route, and these days uh, the uh, glass ceiling is double glazed. You have to get through into postgraduate as well as into uh, undergraduate. <coughs> and there is, of course, in those figures, a challenge, too, for the metrics which are going to be used in the teaching excellence uh, framework. And it's very important that we all of us who are committed to uh, social mobility are aware of the possible adverse impact of the TEF on social mobility unless we actively uh, discount uh, uh, for the phenomenon which is so well uh, evidenced uh, in, this, uh, in this book. Uh, if I've got a complaint, of course, it's that um, this is volume one. Um, volume two needs to be about mature and part-time uh, uh, students. Um, uh, it's interesting that uh, mature students uh, initially showed a significant decline after the changes to student funding. They've now recovered uh, to close to where they were before, but they're not moving ahead <coughs> like, uh, like they once were. And, uh, and part-time has been an unmitigated disaster, some 55% decrease in the numbers of part-time students uh, uh, since uh, the introduction of the new fee regime. Uh, and uh, uh, many of those part-time students would have come from disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. So it's it is important that we uh, gain more evidence about what's caused that uh, and what we can do uh, there. But that does move me at least on to what um, uh, uh, can be done. Um, in terms of, uh, of entry, um, uh, the book is able to point to something which is really important that I can't. Um, legally, I'm not allowed to say anything about admissions uh, to, to universities. So I will just have to point out that the book makes it very clear uh, that the quickest remedy for the discrimination against lower socioeconomic groups is some kind of contextual information in admissions. Um, and that would, uh, uh, that would pay off well because the evidence in the book and from elsewhere is uh, that, um, that students from uh, poorer schools uh, outperform uh, uh, what their expectation uh, based on, uh, on their grades. So uh, contextual, uh, a greater use of contextual inf uh, information uh, in admissions uh, would be uh, uh, very important. <coughs> I still believe that outreach is uh, uh, absolutely vital. The universities have got to get out there. 
into um, uh, uh, schools and colleges, um, not only for the reasons that, uh, that Nick says, uh, but because uh, the key issue is about raising attainment. I personally believe that universities can play a key role in raising attainment uh, in schools, and it's a very timely message to give out there at the present time because, of course, the government's attention is very much focused uh, on what universities can do uh, to uh, raise attainment um, in schools. <clears throat> uh, I think there are some attitudinal issues which are also shown up um, in, in, in the book. Um, we need to be well aware of the unconscious bias uh, which exists um, both in admissions and indeed in our universities which are tempering some of these uh, student success uh, uh, phenomena. And then one final observation, um, uh, and uh, uh, I think I heard Nick Hillman say this uh, the other day, it is ironic um, uh, that at the time there's such controversy about introducing more selection into schools uh, that we persist with the most selective higher education system uh, in, in Europe um, uh, and uh, whether actually there should be some more fundamental challenge um, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to the way that uh, uh, we uh, operate admissions uh, in our universities. If we really are to see universities as the driver of social mobility, uh, which <coughs> the uh, government says that it would like to achieve. Lots of points here, but we'll pick them up in a moment. Um, I'd like to go to uh, Chris Wilson now from the Brilliant Club, because so much of today has been about prior attainment and how early um, trajectories are set. Um, might be worth, I'm sure most people in the room know about the Brilliant Club, but putting some context to what you do, I think would be very useful. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and I will do that. But I, like um, Nicholas, the, the first <coughs> thing I would say about this book is that as well as providing uh, some proper research informed information in a manner that is accessible uh, for policy makers and journalists, it does exactly the same for practitioners. Um, and part of what I want to speak about here is a little bit about how we can use some of the lessons from the book almost as a, a checklist for those of us involved in interventions to make sure uh, we're making the, the correct intervention at the correct time in, in the correct way. Um, and the fact that it's accessible at that level, I think, is a great credit to, to, to the authors. Um, I think the, the second thing I would say, overarching, and it's come out so strongly in, in the panel, is almost the, the, most, the biggest triumph of this book is the way in which it treats both the universities and schools as part of a single education system. Um, and I think that if we we're to, to, to challenge some of the, the, the problems um, that are addressed in the book, we need to think exactly in what way one part of the system can help another part of the system and be serious uh, about that. And it, um, it seems um, maybe uh, surprising that someone who works for an organisation called the Brilliant Club is going to, uh, to, to criticise nifty wheezers, um, but uh, that's certainly what, what I hope to do. Um, and to give a little bit of context that, uh, about the, the Brilliant Club, we're uh, an education charity uh, founded by two classroom teachers uh, who seek to uh, ensure fair access to highly selective universities um, by working with pupils who are underrepresented at those institutions by mobilising the research community um, at universities, either as part-time tutors in schools um, or after they've graduated um, from their PhD to train as full-time teachers. Um, so that first programme is called the Scholars Programme and the second programme is called the Researchers in Schools programme. On top of that, we, we also work with the, the Nuffield Foundation to, uh, to work on the Nuffield Research Placement uh, Programme uh, in, in London, um, Greater London, Surrey, and now uh, Essex uh, as well, um, which does exactly what I think a lot of the, the most interesting interventions um, can do if you were thinking about this as a problem that affects the whole education sector, <coughs> is consider the fractures in that system. So those key transition points between Key Stage 2 and Key Stage 3, between uh, school and university, and then between university um, and uh, careers. I'm certainly not uh, equipped to talk in, in great depth about all those transitions, and I certainly don't want to do so now. But I would say that uh, more research needs to be done into that Key Stage 2, Key Stage 3 transition um, to, to really understand why, as the book points out, some pupils who are identified as high attaining um, when they go into secondary school fall so badly off track by the time um, that, that they leave. 
what I am going to talk about then uh, briefly in response to, to the book um, is this idea of systemic challenge. Um, if one thinks of it as one part of the system helping another part of the system, what universities can do in, in terms um, of attainment, why I think sometimes universities might be shy about doing that, and why, um, in, in contrast to the grumpiness from the first speaker, I feel really cheerful um, <laughs> uh, about what it is that, that universities can offer um, in this area um, before taking off um, uh, taking up John's kind offer of, of, of further research and suggesting some other areas in, in which the, this work could, could eventually stem. Um, my experience is uh, not, I hasten to add, uh, universal. We work with uh, Key Stage 2, so from, from primary schools up to Key Stage 5, in about 450 schools uh, up and down the country, and our coverage is, is relatively good in rural, coastal, and urban, but um, I will emphasise that as a, a charity, I can only speak from the experience of those schools that I, that I do work with. But from our experience, if we are to address this as a systemic challenge, and if, as um, particularly Chapter 5 of the book draws out so clearly, the problem is prior attainment, teachers have to be the key to unlocking that challenge. Um, and as I read through the book, I came up with this, uh, this sort of checklist in my head that, that anyone who is putting an intervention from university to support school must ask themselves, I think, when it comes to interventions that are meant to support higher attainment of pupils. The first is, is this intervention doing something that a teacher couldn't do themselves um, or isn't able to do because of the, the, the system? And the second is, is it supporting teachers to do what they're good at even better? Um, and if you can answer yes to, to one of those questions, then I think that the intervention can make a contribution to this issue of prior attainment. And universities shouldn't be shy of saying that they can make a big difference in, the, in, in that area, but it needs to tick those, the, those two crucial boxes. Essentially, it shouldn't feel like it's something that is being done to a school. And too often we come across interventions where it says that they felt like the intervention came in and it was done to them. Um, the great news about all of this is that schools have not dissimilar accountability measures to what universities are looking to try and improve in schools. Um, so it shouldn't be that hard to align the strategic needs of schools and universities together. So it's surprising that sometimes schools feel like an intervention is being done to them. Um, and that, I think, if we're talking about one united education system under the DfE, is something um, that we should all be looking to consider. So if that is uh, a question around how, as uh, interventions looking to support attainment, we work with teachers, I think there is also a question um, around resourcing. And I suppose a, a challenge to those going out and thinking about policy here would be if we're saying, um, um, I think as John brought out really clearly at the end, that contextualising uh, university admissions on the basis of school characteristics, so of the performance of schools in terms of attainment, is going to have benefit, then we should also be thinking of how the money goes to those schools. And to me there's a, a, an ongoing question about pupil premium. Um, I'm thinking about whether there is a, a more effective mechanism for pupil premium supporting those schools who are struggling to get that higher attainment from their pupils. Because one of the things that I hear consistently when we go out to rural and coastal schools is that because they have a, a slightly lower percentage of pupils who are eligible for free school meals, but are consistently struggling with progression to highly selective universities from the institution, they feel like they're not getting the funding that matches the challenges that they're facing. And if we're really to challenge this rural and coastal divide, pupil premium is as an effective measure as you're going to get. And if we've learned anything from the last couple of months, we shouldn't be waiting for the national funding formula to resolve those particular uh, issues. So why do I think that universities should be cheerful about all of this? Um, it, I think the, the most obvious is the most simple. Um, if we're, we're talking about attainment being the issue, um, and we're talking about attainment being related to subject knowledge, universities are in the best possible place to be able to support with the increase in subject knowledge in schools. Um, so that is itself is, is really exciting. And if they get it right, they get bright pupils who go on to perform, even outperform, some uh, of their peers from, from more advantaged backgrounds. And schools want the same thing, so it, it's not as if these interventions if done right, are going to be pushing against a closed door. They're going to be pushing against an open door, as long as you can get that strategic alignment. 
Um, and I think um, this may be the, the, the area which is less exciting for universities, but that strategic alignment just relies a lot on securing logistics. And schools are incredibly busy places, and if you can get an attainment raising activity that supports with logistics, then I think that, that, that you're on to uh, win it. And finally, and perhaps in some respects the most obvious of all of these things, if attainment is the biggest issue and teachers are, are the key to unlocking attainment, we have to remind ourselves that the majority of teachers are still trained at universities. Um, and if universities can improve the recruitment and the quality of the, the teaching profession, they'll be having the most direct possible impact on securing higher attainment um, for, for pupils. Um, and I think that there is a, a lot of work that can still be done um, in collaboration between universities and SCIT, school centred initial teacher training providers, a lot of work that can be done through traditional <laughs> PGCEs um, to be building up the kind of skills and expertise that research like this demonstrates teachers need to have in order to secure both that prior attainment and the information, advice and guidance for their pupils. So lots of reasons, I think, to be cheerful about how un universities, the latter part of the system, can help um, the, the earlier part of the system right from key stage two. And I would emphasize this as one uh, lesson that I would take home from our, the charity's own experience, is that universities can support pupils as early as primary school, and they can make a difference there. So then, on to my final point, which is where do I think some more research needs to be done? One thing that continues to, to interest me and continues to be hard to extract, I think, from the literature is this, I think, that when people hear prior attainment, they, they turn off a curriculum. They think, oh, it needs to be a direct curriculum intervention. It would be interesting to find out more whether there is a link between expectations um, and prior attainment, whether we can unpick some of the stuff which doesn't necessarily mean direct tutoring of people's <laughs> own curricular topics in order to support academic um, uh, attainment. And then finally, and, and going back to the point that Anna made right at the end of the first session, which I think is a really important one, having talked about how universities can help schools, I think it's always worth reminding universities, particularly when we look at the differential degree outcomes, that they could be learning a, a lot from schools that are less than two miles from where we are today, who've managed to turn some of the fortunes of their pupils around. The pedagogy and practices that are happening in our schools show that not necessarily every trajectory is dictated by prior attainment when the pupils arrive at the door at secondary school. And it would be, I think, a, an interesting experiment to see if universities, in building up some of the evidence base for the TEF, could go out to see what has been done at our best schools uh, about trying to narrow those attainment gaps. Thank you very much.